It is a real pr pleasure uh, to introduce our uh, visitor today. Um, Kristen Smith is a researcher, writer, social justice advocate, and activist anthropologist. She is currently associate professor of African and African Diaspora Studies and Anthropology at the University of Texas at Austin. She is additionally an affiliate faculty member of the University of Texas Center for Women and Gender Studies, as well as a faculty affiliate of the Teresa Lasana Long Institute for Latin American Studies, which, if you don't know, is the largest center for Latin American studies in the United States. Kristen earned her undergraduate degree in anthropology from Princeton University and her doctorate in cultural and social anthropology from Stanford University. Her early work uh, focused on Near Eastern studies, and she participated in field work in Morocco and Tunisia. Later, during her doctoral work, she turned her attention to African diaspora, which led her to Brazil. All of us here get led to Brazil at some point. Um, I thought I would note a couple of things from her CV. She is an accomplished translator and received a commendation from the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival for her translation of the play, O Pagador de Promesses, which I know many of you uh, are familiar with. Her, her translated title is The Promise Keeper. She's also received a number of prestigious awards, including a Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation Career Enhancement Fellowship and a Ford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship for achieving excellence in college and university teaching. Kristen's work currently focuses on engendered anti-black state violence and black community responses to it in Brazil and the Americas. She particularly focuses on transnational anti-black police violence, black liber liberation struggles, the paradox of black citizenship in the Americas, and the dialectic between the enjoyment of black culture and the killing of black people. Her work in Brazil uses the lens of performance to examine the immediate and long-term impact of police violence on black people and black community responses to this violence. Her more recent work, comparative work, examines the lingering, deadly impact of police violence on black women in Brazil and the U.S. In addition to writing and researching, Kristen also collaborates with black Brazilian organizers in the struggle to end anti-black genocide in Brazil and beyond. Her book, is entitled Afro Paradise Blackness Violence in Performance in Brazil, chronicles black Brazilians' experiences with police violence in Bahia and the state's construction of Bahia as an exotic space through the lens of the theater. Today, today her, title, her lecture is entitled Brazil's Afro Paradise, Performance, Race, Violence, and the Black Body in Times of Terror. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Smith to BYU. First, let me say thank you to Dr. Nielsen for this wonderful invitation. This is my first time here in Utah ever. Um, and he, on the way from the airport, he told me that there were mountains and I couldn't see them and I told him, I don't believe you. And then I woke up and there were all these beautiful mountains. And so you are blessed to be in a very beautiful school. Um, and I also would like to thank the, the Africana Research Program um, and the Kennedy Center for supporting my talk. I really appreciate it. It's lovely to finally meet you. Um, Dr. Thompson, we've been talking back and forth on email and so I appreciate that. And I appreciate all of you for coming out today. So my talk today is based on my long-term field research in Brazil. I have been traveling to Brazil and um, working with black organizers there since 2001. And I have been working on um, working around questions of police violence and particularly violence against black communities since 2003. Um, much like many of you, I first traveled to Brazil as an exchange student, um, and I actually started going to Brazil wanting to learn more about poetry and black identity. Um, I wanted to do work on the theater scene there. I had learned about the group Banda Teatro Lodum, um, which is one of the few black theater troops in Brazil, and I was ready and gung-ho to go to Brazil and talk about theater for my dissertation project. The only problem was when I got there and I started to talk to people about black identity and the relationship between black identity and culture, and I told them about my project, um, what many people from the community told me was, you know, we don't really need you to write about the way I, black identity is formed through the theater. What we need you to talk about is the violence that we suffer every day at the hands of the state. 
And that really struck me. And as an anthropologist who is socially engaged, I felt it my duty to focus on what people wanted me to focus on and to focus on what people told me that they was urgent in their lives. And so my work grows out of that conversation. To initiate my discussion today, let me begin with an invocation. I can't breathe. The tragic death of Eric Garner on July 17, 2014, at the hands of police became the impetus for a new phase in the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. It also radically reshaped our conceptual understanding of the theatricality and performance of police violence. The simple words, I can't breathe, the last words that Eric Garner uttered became an incantation, a conjuring, so to speak, of the ghosts of the lethality of state-sponsored racism. Yet the words became the script that accompanies the use of performance, die-ins, as a public practice of resistance in the face of racism. Repeating the words, I can't breathe 11 times, lying down on the ground for four and a half minutes to mark the time that Eric Garner struggled, momentarily draws our political focus away from the rhetorical questions of civil rights, body cams, and racial profiling, back to the materiality of the black body in pain and black suffering. These simple gestures in short periods of time managed to capture the affect of not only the contemporary political struggle of black survival, but also its trans-temporal and trans-spatial resonance. On television and YouTube, we are forced to watch Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, and countless others die over and over again, looping in time in ways that recall our recent and distant past. This repetition mimics the circularity of the looping of the Rodney King video of 1992, or the circulation of lynching postcards in the early 20th century. This visual and somatic economy in part evidences the centrality of the performance and performativity of anti-black violence to the modern American nation state. We can't breathe. Yet these politics are not, uni not unique to the United States. Although much of our national discussion around anti-black policing has focused on our U.S. perspective, this violence is a global phenomenon that has diasporic implications. The case of Brazil is indicative of this reality. The epidemic of anti-black police violence in Brazil presents similar opportunities for reflection on the performance and performativity of anti-black violence, particularly policing. And many in Brazil's community have also turned to performance and specifically the theater to denounce and unmask this violence. From 2003 to 2005, I conducted field research with a grassroots black theater troupe named Choque Cultural, or Culture Shock. Culture Shock was founded in 1994 in a working class neighborhood in the peripheral region of Salvador. Motivated by the constant shock and siege, quote unquote, of police raids, racial profiling, poverty, and inequality, the founders formed Culture Shock in order to create a positive form of recreation for neighborhood youth and a space to speak out against injustice. Inspired by the politics of long standing black Brazilian organizations like the Movimento Negro Unificado and Iliae, the founders positioned themselves as an anti racist, pro black organization. The result was a sharp and edgy form of theater that interrogates everything from Brazil's infamous racial cordiality to the transnational and translocal interconnections between the United States war on Iraq and Afghanistan, excuse me, to police invasions of the peripheral neighborhoods of Bahia. However, culture shocks theater is much more than just a reflection on the dehumanizing effects of racism. The troupe also reveals how anti-blackness and state violence are part of the very fabric of black life in Bahia and define the space of the city itself. And for those of you that may have been tra may have traveled to Brazil, you may know a little bit about Bahia. Bahia is considered one the kind of apex of black culture in Brazil. It is the known for its its rich African heritage and much of its tourist industry is fueled based on that association between blackness and Bahia. 
However, Culture Shock's theater is much more than just a reflection on the dehumanizing effects of racism. The truth, the troupe also reveals how anti-blackness and state violence are part of the very fabric of black life in Bahia and define the space of the city itself. The theater as a performance space decodes the layers of secrecy and silence that define Bahia as what I call Afro-paradise. On August 22, 2014, while demonstrators in Ferguson, Missouri, headed to the streets in the mass protests following the death of Michael Brown, over 51,000 people in cities across Brazil also took to the streets to speak out against police brutality and racial profiling. But their primary motivation was not the death of Michael Brown, and they had been organizing for at least seven years before the hashtag Black Lives Matter was started. Founded in Salvador, in Salvador in 2005, the React or Die campaign has been consistently organizing against the genocide of black people by the Brazilian state transnationally, catapulting the question of anti-black genocide to the forefront of Brazilian politics for the first time in Brazil's history. For React or Die, Brazil's anti-black genocide is the summation of deliberate police killings, death squad murders, and the mass incarceration of black people. My theorization of anti-black violence as a transnational phenomenon emerges from my collaborations with both Shoki Cultural and the grassroots movement React or Die. And so I've been collaborating with React or Die since 2005 when they first started. So in order to give you a bit of context, I wanna talk about b police violence in Brazil. And I want to do that by showing a video that was done about React or Die and their struggle around Carnival. And today, my talk is going to be broken down um, into three vignettes. And basically, the, the structure of the vignettes is around this notion of dialectical montage. And dialectical montage is a collection of ideas, a collage, let's say, um, of ideas, video, and stories meant to convey meaning in a non-linear way, okay? And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about different sections, and this video I wanna use as an introduction, but I want you to remember this video when we come back to the discussion on Carnival, because this video is about an incident that happened around Carnival, okay? Can you all hear? Can people in the back hear? Se você é uma pessoa negra, é muito perigoso. Aqui não é um lugar confortável, aqui não é um lugar pacífico. As mães têm medo quando os filhos saem para a rua. A polícia, ao mínimo que ele faz, é bater em sua cara, te espancar, te torturar na rua. Nós somos a maioria da população no país da Bahia, mas nós vivemos como se estivéssemos no apartheid.
So that video should give you a bit of an overview of the kinds of circumstances that people are facing in Brazil. And the rest of my talk today is going to be based on this context, okay? So I want you to, like I said, I want you to keep that in mind, and I also want you to come back to that when we start to talk about carnival. So my talk is today is based on my book, Afro Paradise, The Black Body, Violence, and Performance in Brazil. And although the book makes five claims, there are three that I really want us to think about today. The first of, that, first of those claims that I want to think, think about today is that racial democracy and violence against the black body go hand in hand. So one of the things that we are taught early on when we start to learn about Brazil is that Brazil, in Brazil, there's a fluidity of races, race doesn't matter, Latin America has a different racial context. But one of the things that black movement organizers have been arguing for over 50 years is that in actuality, the racial democracy that Brazil touts is a very violent reality for black people. So the pretense of equality, the pretense of Racelessness is actually built on the elimination of blackness, both physically and symbolically. And so that's one of the things I talk about in the book, and that's one of the things I want to talk about today. The second thing is that state violence is performative, okay? Now, when I use the term performative, I'm talking about the term that J.L. Austin, a theorist, developed, and the relationship between speech and act. But I'm building on that term based on another theorist's work named Judith Butler, who said that there's a relationship between discourse and performance or discourse and action. In other words, what we say and what we do go hand in hand. And so one of the things that I talk about in my work is that although Brazil has a rhetoric of racial democracy, in actuality, the way that the state performs in relationship to black people and black bodies says something very, very different from a racial democracy. Okay, And so while the country is talking about racial egalitarianism, the realities of the enactment of police violence are actually performing a kind of anti-blackness and even more so an anti-black genocide. Remember those numbers from the video. So you have 11,197 people being killed by the police in Brazil officially, Okay, officially, and when we get to question and answer, we can talk about the discrepancy with the official statistics over the over from between excuse me between 2009 and 2014. Just to give you a comparison, that's compared to our official numbers here in the United States with 11,000 people being killed by the police over the past 30 years. All right. That's a huge discrepancy. And what I'm not trying to say is that, okay, well, Brazil is so much worse than the United States. We don't really have a problem here. We have a problem in both places. But what I am saying is that when we think about police violence, and that's something that's at the forefront of our conversations here in the United States today, we can't talk about that as if it were an isolated incident. We can't talk about that as if it were a U.S. problem, because it's not a U.S. problem, all right? If we look at Brazil, we realize that this is a regional problem, it's a trans national problem and there's even more evidence to show us how transnational it is okay and so one of the things that I'll say anecdotally excuse me very quickly is that during the Ferguson protests back in 2014, one of the things that people would often talk about was the use of tear gas that was coming from Palestine, right? You remember that? So you had this um, the tear gas canisters that people were using in Israel that were being also used in Ferguson against the protesters. Does everybody remember that coming on the news? It was on CNN. It was on a lot of things, okay? So one of the things that's interesting about that is that despite that con connection, what we, did, what we don't think about is the fact that police departments in Brazil have been doing exchange programs, for example, with the NYPD for the past 20 years. And so many of the tactics that the Brazilian police use have actually been used, learned in conversation with NYPD, particularly zero tolerance practices that were learned in the 1990s. Moreover, many of the torture and dis disappearance tactics that are used by police in Brazil were actually taught in the School of the Americas, all right? Does everybody know what the School of the Americas was? No. Okay, so the School of the Americas, and this is very, this is, 
if, if you're really interested in it, I encourage you to look it up because it's sometimes we it sounds like a conspiracy theory um, until we look at the, the U.S. Senate transcripts on it. And I encourage you to look at the U.S. Senate transcripts on the School of the Americas. And so the School of the Americas was a school that the United States had in order to train foreign governments in guerrilla suppression as part of the Cold War. And one of the things that the United States did was train many of the dictatorships throughout Latin America as part of that program, all right? One of the tactics or one of the strategies that the United States, um, one of the, let's call them practices, yeah, that's a better word. One of the practices that the United States would teach at the School of the Americas was torture practices. And those torture practices were therefore, were subsequently used in the dictatorships throughout Latin America in the 1970s, 1960s, and 1980s. So Chile, Argentina, those places, but also Brazil. And one of the things that we know is that many of those practices that were taught in the, in the School of the Americas are still being used and perpetuated by the police in Brazil today. So when we get to talking about Kabula, what was done to the boys in Kabula, we can trace back to the School of the Americas, all right? And so when we think about policing and we think about violent policing, to not consider its transnational elements is to be not only ahistorical, but to decontextualize. And that's one of the things that I want to talk about. And finally, that there's a relationship between v violence, performance, and undoing. So if violence is necessarily a performance, right? If the police, if we think of the police as a theater, okay? If violence is necessarily a performance, then one of the things that might be key to its undoing is performance as well. And so that's how I'm going to conclude today. And I'm gonna have to move through quickly. So I'll talk about three vignettes. The first vignette is Afro Paradise, and that's when I'm going to define that term. The second is Carnival, and the third is Breath. And like I said, I'm doing a dialectical montage, so I'm not going to transition between these. I'm just going to give you three quick insights and then keep moving on, okay? Afro Paradise. Grainy home videos show a young boy kicking high and bending low in a fast-paced rhythm that glitters with genius. To even the untrained eye, he is clearly very good. He does not miss a beat as one of the competitors slips out of the circle and another taps in, kicking, bending, and swirling with choreographed motion. Ten-year-old Joel Concesson Castro has loved capoeira his whole life. Capoeira is a martial art that was developed by enslaved Africans in Brazil and has survived as a cultural practice. It is a hallmark of the black, Brazil, of the black cultural heritage of Bahia, Joel's home. His teachers stand by proudly watching and excitingly and lovingly coaching him. They are training him to be the next great Capoeira master in a long community tradition. Months later, little Joel sits in front of another camera to record a commercial for Bahia Tursa, the state of Bahia's tourist agency. Sitting in a bright white t-shirt, head high with a big smile on his face, he talks about his beloved capoeira and one of his favorite people, his dad, Joel Mestrinina, a capoeira master. His face beams when he talks about his love for capoeira. He, he, he laughs and looks up into the sky as if he knows that his inspiration and passion come straight from heaven. He melts our hearts with his round cheeks and brown eyes. The short shoots back and forth between high definition shots of Joel's smiling face and stock shots of happy, jovial black people. The scenes are interposed with images of sun-kissed speeches of Bahia and recognizable tourist cities. The video, one of many like it produced by Bahia Tursa, happily announces that Joel is the new face of Bahia. It lists all of the reasons to make the city of Salvador your next vacation spot. It is the perfect publicity piece for a destination renowned for its black culture and black people. I want to be a capoeira master when I grow up, just like my dad. This is the new Bahia. In the early morning hours of November 22, 2010, just as little Joel lay down to go to bed, military police invaded his community. They came in shooting, as they often do, during raids on the periferia, the periphery. 
The periphery encompasses the literal and figurative marginal zones isolated on the outskirts of urban cities and strategically confined and contained as ghettos within Brazil's urban centers. This is where the majority of black working class people live. A stray bullet comes into the house and strikes Joel in the face. Distraught, his father begins to desperately call out to his oldest son for help. Joel's brother, Jay Anderson, picks up Joel in his arms, and he and his father desperately head outside. They go from house to house, but neighbors, fearing for their lives, do not open their doors because of the bullets flying. Mestini Nina and Jay Anderson then turn to the invading police officers for help. The response is vicious. An officer supports his gun at Mestini Nina and says, either you turn back now or I'm going to do to you what I did to your son. Seeing what is going on, community members begin to rally, insisting that the police help the boy. Angry and exasperated, Mestini Nina begins to argue with the officers. A neighbor who recognizes him comes out and offers his assistance. He drives the, the three to the general hospital. Little Joel is pronounced dead later that day. The tale of Joel da Conceição Castro encapsulates a cruel irony. There is a paradoxical relationship between Bahia's identity as an exotic, black, jovial playland where anyone, especially tourists, can enjoy black culture and black people, and the state's use of terror against the very black bodies that ostensibly produce this space, Afro-paradise. This gendered, sexualized, and raced imaginary has made the region a sizzling tourist industry on the one hand and a space of violent anti-black repression on the other. Yet these two seemingly conflicting actions are not in opposition to one another. Rather, Bahia as an Afro-paradise and Bahia as a space of death for black people are two sides of the same coin. Afro-paradise is a choreographed theatrical performance between the state's celebration of black culture and the state's routine killing of the black body. The rhetoric of Bahia's racial melting pot, racial democracy, and Afro-paradise go hand in hand a relationship that is key to destruct, deconstructing the complexities of racial politics in Brazil and elsewhere. The atmosphere of violence in Bahia is not in contradiction to Afro-paradise. Rather, it is constitutive of it. Why has state terror against black people become so acute? And what does this tell us about the relationship between the commodification of black culture and the killing of the black body? Vignette number two, Carnival. In February 2015, just around Carnival, a special operations unit of the Bahia Military Police, Hondespi, invaded the community of Villa Moises in the working class black neighborhood of Kabula and killed 12 and wounded four. This was what was referenced in the video. The victims were between the ages of 15 and 27. The killing became known as the Kabula Massacre and was one of the deadliest police actions in Bahian history. The Hondespi officers who invaded Villa Moises claimed that they had been involved in a shootout with criminals hoarding arms and planning to rob a bank. But witnesses maintained that the officers rounded up a group of young people who took them to a remote location, brutalized them one by one, and shot 12 execution style. When family members and local activists went to the morgue to pick up the bodies, they found the young men dressed curiously in military fatigue, a sign that the police had tampered with the bodies before sending them in. The conflict between Hondespi's account and the community's account led neighbors and family members of those killed to begin collaborating with React or Die. They wanted to put pressure on the state government to do a federal investigation and hold the Hondespi officers accountable. In response, the police officers began a terror campaign against the community, which included occupation, surveillance, and intimidation, which continues today. Nowhere does Afro-Paradise become more salient and more palpable than during Bayan Carnival, its apex. As anthropologist Robin Sheriff observes, Brazilian carnival bears a metonymic relation to the Brazilian nation in ways other than typically invoked. 
the glittering surfaces of carnival, like the polite discourses of racial democracy, both of which are performed not only for Brazilians, but also for a transnational audience, conceal complex forms of contestation that engage both the political and moral economy of race in Brazil. Yet in the case of Bahia, Carnival does not conceal Afro-Paradise. It encapsulates and epitomizes it. And this is a, an aerial picture of the Carnival Parade in Bahia. And I wanted to show this because what you can see is the way that race defines the way that the parade is structured. And so in the middle, if anybody's ever seen Carnival, people who pay in order to participate with the groups can be inside of ropes that block things off from the side, which is called the pipoca or the popcorn. And typically it's rich white tourists that are able to participate in carnival, whereas the black residents of Salvador who don't get to pay are, res res are resigned to the sidelines, okay? In January of 2007, a controversial photo of a police stop and frisk incident just before carnival circulated like wildfire. In this photo, a white policeman straddles a black man, steps on his head with his boot, and points a gun to his back, the foaming waves of the ocean lapping behind the two. The altercation occurred on the beach at Ongina, just blocks away from where little Joel was killed. Here's the background story. A white Spanish female tourist was robbed on the beach and a police officer approached a vendor as a potential suspect. I first learned about this brouhaha when I received the, the photo through an activist listserv. The, the episode had already ignited protests and a series of public debates among black activists who tied the incidents to the state's pre-carnival cleanup efforts. The compound injustice of the scene and its race, gendered, sexualized, and class implications incense black movement organizers. A white female European tourist, non-citizen, feeling threatened by a black man, citizen, is quickly protected by the state, the police officer standing in as the proxy and protector patriarch, at the expense of a taxpaying native resident. The series of images and the story cap captured the story surrounding it captured the lived reality of racial apartheid and police harassment in Bahia in high relief. Anthropologist Faye Harrison defines apartheid as a policy of enforced separation between the races, noting the term is also used to characterize an, any invidious structure and practice of racial inequality, intended or unintended. When we think of apartheid, we tend to think of South Africa, yet Brazil also adheres to the colonial logics of racial apartheid. Police violence is both an abstracting process and a process that defines social and material identities. In other words, if we think about Brazil as being structured around racial apartheid, then the police are the border patrol between two different spaces, a colonized space and a non-colonized space. This entangled relationship suggests that killing the black body is a performance that the nation state engages to declare itself a heteropatriarchal society that is true to the global politics of white ascendancy. Vignette number three, breath. So I wanna close today by looking at Culture Shock's performances and particularly Two clips, if I can. I don't know if I'm going to have time, but if I do have time, I want to show two clips. The first clip is their performance of Brazil's racial, racial apartheid and how they see it. And I want you to particularly pay attention to the way that they engage in a politics around the wall. And in many ways, for them, the wall represents not only the barrier between races in Brazil, but also the police that embody that barrier. So this first clip is called the Berlin Wall. Agora existe em Salvador. 
Com licença aqui, deixa eu passar aqui. Aqui, não, negão! Mas como pode? As universidades brasileiras, 2% dos alunos são negros. Isso quer dizer que 98% são brancos. And these statistics are from 19, or 2003, so this is a little dated. Jogo no 9, jogo no 11, jogo no 13, 28, 44. Não tem uma apresentadora do programa infantil negra. E nós vivemos num país onde 85% da população é negro. Eu vou entrar aí agora. E vocês vão ser você agora. Aqui tá vendo, não, Mas espere um momento. Espere um momento. E se eu pagar 200 mil reais aí pra ir? Aí sim. So the clip, the clip that you just saw is an allegory of racial apartheid in Brazil. And in essence, what they are arguing is that at every turn, despite the fact that, peop that black people are supposed to be included into the nation, there are invisible barriers that actually stop people from having access to resources. And so there's a lot of layers here, and if you want to hear more about all of the nuances, I actually talk about this clip in depth in the chapter two of my book, and I welcome you to, to take a look at that. And I can also talk about it in a, in a second and question and answer. But in essence, what I want us to get from this is that there are ways that racial apartheid is perpetuated and enacted in the everyday, embodied in the everyday, that aren't necessarily talked about and said in Brazil. And if you don't understand that embodiment and the ways that things are not talked about or said, then you really miss some of the nuances of the social structure of Brazil. And so that's really the point of that particular clip. And I actually want to end by, do, by showing you the clip of their performance of a police raid. And I want us to remember the story of Joel as we're talking about this. Because one of the most powerful things about this performance, and like I said before, this performance was in 2003 in a peripheral neighborhood called Fazenda Grande do Retiro. Okay, so it's a performance that's in the street, you're surrounded by people from the community, and it's intended for people from the community. It's not intended for people from the outside. Okay, and so in this particular clip, what you're going to see are people from the community kind of engaging in this very tragic reality in their lives in a comical way that's also deeply personal and deeply touching. And I want you to pay particular attention to the very end when they're giving out a list of the communities that have been invaded by the police and one woman from the audience interjects her community into the list. Because in many ways what I see is that that particular interjection reminds us of the power of performance in interrogating and actually turning upside down the violent ways that performance is embodied by the state. Está 
So it's that last interjection plataforma that I think is one of the most powerful aspects of this particular performance and part of the reason that, part of what motivated me to write about it. And there's a number of things, again, layers about this performance that I'm not going to be able to get to right now because I actually want to open up for question and answer. But one of the things that I want to talk about very briefly is the use of white masks. And so one of the things that they're doing when they have the white masks and then they take them off is showing the ways that although all of the police officers may not be white, they embody white supremacy. And that is a very direct critique of the notion that racism only happens based on individual subjective identities. And so that's something, it's a structural analysis that I think is very nuanced and one that really needs to be put forward and put on the table as we continue to discuss these issues, particularly here in the United States. And so I, I definitely wanna leave some time for question and answer and I'd like to open it up and thank you very much. No questions, everything was very clear. <laughs> I have questions. Um, I'm familiar with Shoki Cultural. I'm wondering if you could speak about their uh, visibility, mm -hmm. it, speaking of questions of representation. Mm -hmm. um, even within artistic communities outside of Bahia. Yeah, they're not visible. And I think that that's something that's important to note. So this is a community organization that's very grassroots and they're not professional, they don't travel. Um, and they've actually gone through a lot of hardship um, because they're not supported by the government, they're not supported by um, a private institution or foundation. And basically they have been fluctuating as an organization since about 2005 when a number of members lost their jobs. And so we think about the, the economic hardships that we've had here in the United States, but we don't realize that those things have repercussions overseas as well. And so when people lose their jobs, the first thing that they do is cut back on um, the extracurricular activities that they do. And so this was one of the things, people stopped performing because they didn't have bus fare, for example. Um, and bus fare at that time was about a dollar. Um, so we're talking about people who are very, very poor, people who struggle constantly, um, but I think it's really a testament to, to the question, to the political issues that they're facing, the fact that despite those circumstances, they really found that this particular theater expression to be a way to talk about something that nobody would let them talk about, which is racism in Brazil. Um, and so they're not visible. And I think they, they've been really excited, even though they don't really act together anymore, they've been really excited about the book because it has given them visibility that they would never dream of. Um, and for those who are interested in seeing the entire play, it's actually on the links to my um, book's website through University of Illinois Press, and you can watch the whole thing. It's about 15 minutes. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, what have been the differences in representation that you've seen? Um, we've made strides here in the U.S. to have more black representation in the media mm -hmm. as compared to Brazil, and what can we learn from that? That's a good question. I think Brazil, this is an interesting, this is almost a historical document at this point because it was 13 years ago um, when this particular play happened. And it was a moment when affirmative action was just getting started in Brazil. And now affirmative action has been in place for over 10 years and is very much changing, changing the landscape of representation in Brazil. Um, but what's interesting about that is that it's almost as if it's a symbolic in inclusion without an actual inclusion. And so you have more representation on the, in the media and you have more representation in universities, for example, where whereas at this time you, you had about they say 98% white, that's a, that's a little, that's not exactly accurate. It was about 85% white, the university system, all across Brazil at this time. Um, and today it's about 50% white, which is a huge difference. And that's just because of affirmative action. Um, they have a quota system, which we don't have here in the United States, so their affirmative action has been very different. Um, but you're seeing a change in everything that's happening. And you see people on television the way that you didn't see before. but Surprisingly, given the fact that Brazil is 51% black, 51% of African descent, 
then you would think that it would be even more, and it's not. And I'm of the mindset that the current political turn that we're seeing in Brazil right now is actually a backlash to those strides forward around race relations. And if you pay attention to um, the, question, the conversations around impeachment and the, and the ways that people situate some of the issues that they were angry about with wanting to impeach Jamal Hussafi, race comes up repeatedly. Right, being angry about having to pay your domestic worker a living wage, being angry about having black people in the university system. And so it was very much a reactionary moment. Um, and so I think that, I hope that answers your question, but it's, it's complex, it's very complex. So there is more representation, but there's also more pushback, and I'm not sure the representation is genuine. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. So <clears throat> I'm Amy McLean. I'm an open major for right now. Okay. Um, and I would like to know, because I just came back from Brazil about yeah. two months ago, mm -hmm. and even more than race, I saw an economic, mm -hmm. um, kind of economicism, like racism, but in Where economics. Where city were you in? Well, I was actually in Recife, okay. so just north of Bahia. Mm -hmm. And it was mentioned several times throughout the play as well, you know, oh, you'd let me in if I paid two, 200,000 reais. Mm -hmm. Um, so what is the link between this economic disparity and racism mm -hmm. in these communities in Brazil? Well, I think you can't talk about class without talking about race. There's no such thing in Brazil as talking about classism without talking about racism because mm -hmm. they're intimately linked. And they're intimately linked primarily because of the hegemonic ways that white supremacy works in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And so your ability to get a job has everything to do with your, your proximity to whiteness. And the poorer you are in Brazil, and there, there, there have been a number of really interesting studies that have been done over the last 50 years, starting with Carlos Hassenbaugh and Nelson de Valle Silva, um, former president Fernando Henrique Cardoso, but even more recently um, with work by Edward Teyes, looking at the close relationship between being poor and being black. And so if I were to put up on the board um, a <coughs> graph of poverty, what you would see is a sliding scale based on skin color. So mm -hmm. the darker you are, the poorer you are across the board. Now, that particular vignette when they talk about money paying is a really interesting one because one of the things that I argue in my book is that that actually does it, that in, instead of proving the point that really it's class and not race that matters, what it does is prove the opposite. Because as black people, who have money, you actually still have to ask permission to get to the other side of the wall. Whereas whiteness is given to the other side of the wall. And so there's, that's, that's a nuance that I think we have to really pay attention to. And I think if you're really interested in the relationship between race and class, I would recommend um, Edward Teyes' book, um, Race in Another America. And one of the things that he does, is, which I think is really brilliant, is break down the numbers around upper class um, people in Brazil and blackness, and they're minuscule. The number of people who are upper class in Brazil who are black are literally a handful of people. And much like the United States, they tend to be visible because they're either soccer players or they're entertainers, and so people have a warped sense of how much money black people have, because they're like, well, there are all these rich black people who are soccer players, and they're just like rich basketball players here, and they're all the rich black people who are actors, so they must be doing well. But again, the same argument that we have here holds in Brazil, which is you don't have rich black people who are owning soccer teams, and you don't have rich black people who are owning the actual networks that are, that are showing the actors, and so there's still, even within the rich, black folk are at the bottom. And so you have to kind of pay attention to that nuance to understand how class factors in. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great. My name is Josh Kohler. I'm a Portuguese and Spanish major. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Um, thank you, and I really enjoyed your presentation today. Thank you. Um, my question is in connection with the School of America, as that you mm -hmm. mentioned, um, and I wanted to ask you with your professional and uh, scholarly uh, opinion, what is the message that is being received um, by international members of the black community from the rest of the international community as far as not, con or not condemning or uh, essentially charging with war crimes, state-sponsored torture, 
methods and uh, essentially even with U.S. transcripts um, providing evidence for it, what is the message being sent to the international black community and why is there not being anything done about it? That's a great question. Um, I would encourage everybody, I don't know how much people know about what's going on around Black Lives Matter now in the United States, but there's been recent, um, a recent statement released by the United Nations basically saying that the United States is guilty of genocide, um, implying that in not so many words. Interestingly enough, black folk in the United States have been testifying against the United States government claiming genocide since the 1950s. Um, so back in the 1950s, you have a document called We Charge Genocide um, that was presented to the United Nations and eerily lists many of the th same conditions that black people are facing today. I think in order to answer your question, we have to really interrogate our relationship as an imperial power to the United Nations. We are one of the nations that does not pay attention to what the United Nations says. Um, we have not signed on to the Convention Against Genocide. Um, so we're not beholden to anything that they say. And if we look at history, pretty much every time the United Nations has made a critique against the United States, the United States has gone like this and shrugged its shoulders and said, oh well. Um, you can't separate this conversation out from a conversation around imperialism. And you know, we are the world power. No one is going to be, a not anytime soon, no one is gonna be able to actually prosecute us for some of the things that we've done. The most that I think can happen was what happened with the School of the Americas where a US senator opened an investigation and actually had a Senate hearing around it. Um, and so that's probably the best that can happen. But sadly, I just don't, I, I don't see that conversation making it very far, especially since it's one that we've been trying to have for 66 years. So, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's um, Mark Ween. I'm a history major here nice at BYU you. and an Africana Studies minor. Nice and you. nice to meet you as well. Thank you for your, your presentation. In um, 1962, John F. Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Mm -hmm. With all the uh, racial oppression that's happening in these communities in Brazil mm -hmm. and in the United States, do you feel like there might be some breaking point um, mm -hmm. for these communities in the mm -hmm. near future. Mm -hmm. I think there's been breaking points. Um, and I think that that's why it's imperative that those of us that fight for peace and prefer peace as a method um, really put pressure on nations to address these issues so that we don't have any more breaking points. And so one very famous breaking point in Brazil was in 1994, there was the Kambula, no, excuse me, 1994, there was the Caranjiru massacre um, that happened in one of Sao Paulo's biggest prisons where the SWAT forces, similar to Hondespi that invaded Kabula, invaded the prison after a prison riot, quote unquote, um, and executed um, hundreds of prisoners at close range in their cells. Um, interestingly enough, just a couple of weeks ago, a Brazilian court decided that those police officers would be exonerated after having already previously been convicted. Um, why do I bring that up in response to your question? One of the long-term effects of that injustice that was the Caranjiru massacre was the establishment of the PCC, um, the Primeiro Comando Capital, um, which is a organized group of resistance that came out of the prison system um, that many people call a criminal gang that had literally organized itself to retaliate against the police in response to this and has now taken control over Sao Paulo and most of Rio and many major cities in Brazil. And so the birth of this organized faction, and I, I don't like to use the word criminal because it's just, I think it, it buys into some narratives I don't really support. Mm -hmm. um, the birth of this organized faction that uses violence as its primary method was that particular massacre. 
And so, you know, Kennedy, who I believe was actually, you know, quoting Martin Luther King when he said that, which I think was a really wonderful homage that he did, um, was right. If we don't pay attention to this and we don't start doing something, other people are going to get very angry and they'll do things like the PSS. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joshua Erickson. I'm a Latin American studies major. Nice I was just you. in Bahia this summer mm -hmm. on a field study and I noticed more prominent public groups like Olodum. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm just other drum corps that we visited a couple. Where, where do you see the role of these organizations or other capoeira organizations in promoting, I guess, blackness mm. in Brazil? Do you see them as, because of they're more public, they receive more attention, but do they promote blackness and actually fight against the anti-black campaigns or do they uphold white supremacy? Those are two, I th I, can I parse your question yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I kinda wanna parse your question out. Do they promote blackness? Sometimes. Do they fight white supremacy? Occasionally. It's not consistent, and that's been the primary critique. Um, I think Olodun in the 2013 March Against the Genocide of Black People, because there have been four of them, so 2013 was the first, um, Olodun's director was there, um, and he was very supportive of it. Um, there have been other prominent figures uh, in Brazil, black artists who have been very supportive, but I'm not liberty to say who they are because they are much like here with Black Lives Matter, they want to rena remain anonymous. I think we have to remember that coming out publicly against these issues is dangerous, um, particularly in a place like Bahia where there's retaliation constantly. The people that I work with with React or Die are under death threat. Um, it's not something to take lightly. And so many people are scared to speak out. Many people shy away from speaking out. And I think that it's much easier and much more comfortable to take government money and to perform a polite blackness than it is to interrogate some of the systems of oppression that people are dealing with. And so I think people make different decisions at different times. But for the most part, those organizations, while they've had a very strong legacy, have chosen to take a back seat. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I can do it. I can do three minutes. You want to just do them back to back and I can answer them together? Is that good? Ask both and I'll answer them together if that's okay. Okay. Uh, Jeff Shumway, I'm the coordinator of nice Latin American Studies here. Nice to meet you. Uh, great talk. So uh, I was just wondering if Gilberto Freire is anywhere or is he already completely gone from these discussions or is he still kind of there? Um, he might be a whipping boy, mm -hmm. you know, to hold up and then tear down. Uh, right. I'm just wondering about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and years ago, um, I studied Argentine history, but I also did Brazilian history with Bert Berkman at, mm -hmm. at Arizona. I don't know if you know him, mm -hmm. but uh, we read some things about, um, these are Afro-Brazilian activists from from the 90s who were lamenting that Afro-Brazilians aren't identifying as mm -hmm. Afro-Brazilians. But that was quite a while ago. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how that has changed over, over the years and if, if the Afro-Brazilian activists are, are encouraged by the general population's self-identification as Afro-Brazilian. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Let's go. Oh. Fantastic talk. Thank you. My name is Ryan Gabriel. I'm an assistant professor in sociology here nice at BYU to me as well. And in one of the videos you showed and you kind of discussed about um, kind of these police officers with the white mask, mm -hmm. the mask being removed mm -hmm. to reveal a black individual mm -hmm. and discussing about kind of how this is a, a representation of black police taking on white supremacy. Mm -hmm. and what, what does that teach us about the nature of white supremacy, not only in Brazil, but in the U.S. case? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you for that. You're welcome. I'm going to answer them all together in less than a minute, <laughs> as per Dr. Thompson. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. Gilberto Freire. Gilberto Freire, and I mean this in a loving way, is like a hangnail. He doesn't go away. Um, he has been critiqued incessantly um, for 50 years. And for some reason, he still is very much a larger than life figure and is very much somebody who has been a reference. I think that 
his work is deeply problematic on many different levels. Um, and I think that it, in many senses, I agree with Abdi do Nascimento, who said that Gilberto Freire's um, teachings were really the, under, the undergirding of white supremacy in Brazil, meaning racial democracy is Brazil's white supremacy. Um, and, and it is the cordial way that it is designed to eliminate blackness that is really um, what is so insidious about it. As for people identifying as black, what we have seen over the past 10 years, since the two, between the 2000 and 2010 census, you have a stark change in the number of people identifying as black. There are many theses, theses about this, and um, Edward Tejas and Tiana Pachal have a great essay where they talk about this. Um, one of the theses is the blackening based on affirmative action. So with the affirmative action measures and quotas, a lot of people who didn't want to be black before suddenly do. Um, now that has negative effects where you have people who really should not be claiming blackness, claiming it in order to get benefits, but it also has had the effect of encouraging or making it more comfortable for people who are of African descent to claim their, Af their blackness. And that has, been, that, that has been in many ways positive, in many ways negative, just like anything else. Um, I think it's a mixed bag, but I do think you see, a, if you look at the difference in the census, it's clear. 2000, you have a minority black population. 2010, you have a majority black population. And you can't attribute all of that to births and deaths. And so um, a lot of it is just changing what you say on the census. So, and finally, with this question about white supremacy um, and hegemony, I mean, I, I use hegemony as a framework to talk about white supremacy for that reason. I think that it is a hegemonic social structure. It is one that we all internalize and is one that we perpetuate without our knowledge. Um, it operates on a system of consent and um, capitulation, and I think that it is the order of things. It is the way that we see the world, and it is so natural that we don't question it. And so the critique that they're making is really one to be counter-hegemonic, to really try to disrupt and undo the way that we look at things in the everyday, and I think that's what's beautiful about performance. Because you can show some things that some people won't listen to if you tell it to them. Um, and this question of the relationship between whiteness and white supremacy and policing, I think what we need right now is to rethink our approach to racism. Our, our, our reliance on a understanding of racism as individual bias is limiting. And it is wrong in my, in my assessment. If we only think about bad people doing bad things, then we miss racism altogether. If we start to really understand that racism is a structure, that racism is implicit and explicit, that it's something that is embedded in all of us, and that there are ways that it is operating that we're not conscious of, if we miss that, we miss everything. And I think that that's the critique that they're trying to make. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. And thank you again.